everyone. Welcome to tonight's segment of the Out of State Faculty, Out of State University Faculty Lecture Series. I am not just Gilardi, uh, the director, a director here, and also coordinator of the lecture series. I'm Lindsay. I'm uh, filling in for Jess Gilardi, but if you want to call me Jess, I'm also okay with that. Um, thanks for attending tonight's lecture. Keep an eye out for upcoming lecture series uh, for the rest of the semester. And there will be a lecture next week, March. Well, it's actually not next week. I'm going to correct him on this. March 16th at 6 p.m. in McDaniel 101. And that will be Dr. Bill Ulibar of Sociology. Uh, Jeff Ellison of Psychology, part two. I still don't know squat. <laughs> Evolution is the reason we do not pursue reality. Uh, this evening's event is presented by Dr. Jeff Ellison, professor of psychology. Uh, who had a PhD from the University of Northern Colorado, Education Psychology Post Postdoctoral Fellowship, University of Denver author of The Compass of Shame Scale, which has been translated into 18 languages and used in hundreds of studies. The instrument is used to assess people's preferences among five emotion regulation strategies. These strategies are linked to self-esteem, depression, violence, self-harm, and many other outcomes. The lecture tonight will be about Dr. Ellison's thesis um, that we must take on, take an evo, evolutionary developmental perspective to understand adult thinking. Human adults are the products of a very long evolutionary history and a 20-year history of development, or more. Uh, so we must study infants thinking to understand the strengths and limitations of adult thinking. Uh, I am, this is you, you're presenting two back-to-back -back <laughs> lectures. Part one addresses the developmental perspective, focusing on how complex concepts in adulthood are understand, understood via basic metaphors developed during infancy and childhood. Metaphors are far more pervasive than we realize. Help me in welcoming Dr. Ellison. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for showing up and for the, showing the interest. So yes, three weeks ago I didn't know squat. Three weeks later I still don't know squat. Um, so I'm going to be talking about evolution and how that shapes our perception. And obviously perception is incredibly important to knowledge. That's how stuff gets into the brain. So my three images here, colors don't exist out there in the real world, only in our brains. You see food differently when you're starving or if you're full. And when you're newly in love, you see all kinds of crazy shit, right? Uh, the world's just a, a different place. Uh, you're probably clinically insane. So my goal is to understand adult thinking and knowledge, how that works. So this is really is um, a twist on epistemology. And uh, as the introduction pointed out, um, I think you need to understand two things. You need to understand the developmental process, how we bootstrap from a zygote to a college graduate who knows a whole lot, and also our evolutionary history and how that has shaped our thinking. So this is an evo-devo perspective. Uh, it fits in with the idea of embodied cognition, that cognition happens in brains. Brains are an organic organ that are set inside a body, a body that exists in our environment. So we have to consider all those things. So I'm jumping to the conclusion, since I shortchanged it a little bit last time. Uh, just like the title says, I don't know squat, Socrates said, I know that I know nothing. So I'm just imitating Socrates. Um, I want to start here with the idea of naive realism. So naive realism, I'm not, this isn't a put down to anyone, this is the actual term that's used. Uh, it's naive to think that we actually see the world as it really is, that it simply comes in through the eyes, that we have direct perception. So you might think that looking out your eyes is like looking out a window. What's out there comes through the window and right to your brain. Nope, not at all. That's not what's happening. So uh, this metaphor, talked about metaphor last time, is a really good metaphor. Uh, sometimes it's used as a thought experiment. You know, what would it like to be like to have a brain in a vat? You know, could it achieve consciousness and things like that? Well, we are brains, not in vats, but in a bony skull that have no connection to the outside world except through our senses. And we also have to be connected to our inside world. Uh, we eventually develop maps of our body, you know, where our fingers are in space. Babies don't know that. They're clueless. Um, so we have this very difficult task, and it happens through this interface. Um, <clears throat> So what happens between the eyeballs and the brain is a lot of transitions. What leaves the eyeballs 
It's basically just zeros and ones. I mean, it's neurons firing or not firing. There's no color, there's no motion, there's no size or shape or anything that's directly being transmitted. I mean, it's kind of like a Morris code, but the problem is the receiver doesn't know what the code is. The baby has to figure that out. The baby has to develop those brain areas to say, oh, okay, this is what's happening. And I associate that with red or whatever uh, the case may be. So <clears throat> in some ways we know less. Uh, we see less about reality than is really there. And in many ways we see more. We see an enhanced reality. So we're not seeing straight reality at all. I used this slide last time. This talk, like last time, is not really a talk about reality. It's a talk about the reality of human knowledge and thinking. So it's kind of recursive, thinking about thinking. And uh, again, it's going to lead us to the conclusion that we don't know reality. Um, three weeks ago, I talked about metaphor, the metaphorical nature of our knowledge. So, you know, we think about um, time as a dimension. We think about time uh, as distance, uh, but it isn't. Uh, but that's the metaphor that we use. Uh, now I'm going to talk about senses and perception and evolution. And that's uh, uh, the other piece to this. So we can think about different types of realities. Mind-independent reality is what we think is there when there's no one looking, no animal looking, no one hearing or smelling or anything. It's you know, the real reality, what's really out there. Mind-dependent reality is what we perceive. So color, sound, taste, smell, even meaning, certainly pain. All of these things don't exist without brains. So they're brain-dependent or mind-dependent, right? So uh, in this image, maybe the one on the left, I have a question mark. Maybe that's a little bit more like mind-independent reality because colors don't exist out there in reality where color vision only exists in mind, so that'd be mind-dependent reality. So another way to frame naive realism is that if you're a naive, naive realist, you believe that mind-dependent reality is the same as mind-independent reality, that you're capturing what's there. Again, direct perception. And that's not the way it is. Um, and this is also sort of the conclusion of this is we need to have a sense of epistemic humility, uh, epistemology meaning knowledge. We need to have humility about our knowledge, the nature of our knowledge. It's, you know, fairly limited and approximate in many ways. So I'm going to make a, uh, use a metaphor, an analogy between this geocentric view of the universe and why we fell prey to that false belief for so long and why we fall prey to the false belief of naive realism. So we can ask, why the false belief? Everybody knows this isn't reality, right? There's the sun in the middle, and we're spinning around the sun. Well, that's the way it looks, right? When I look up, it looks like the sun's moving, and I'm stationary. It feels that way. I mean, we're spinning at 1,000 miles per hour, and the Earth is going around the sun at 66,000 miles per hour. But atmosphere moves with the Earth, so we don't feel it. It doesn't feel like we're moving. So it must be the sun that's moving. We also have issues around uh, egocentrism and anthrocentrism. We have a very human-centered viewpoint, and we have an ego-centered uh, viewpoint. And in psychology, when we talk about egocentrism, we're not talking about egotism or being egotistical. We're saying that I've got one view, and it's hard for me to step out of that. So my favorite example in class is when my daughter was little, she'd be in the backseat of the car, I'm driving along, and she'd be like, hey, Dad, look at this picture. And I'm like, Come on, goofball. You know, that's three feet behind my head. I can't see that picture, right? Everybody see the picture? You can't see the picture. Um, so I know my viewpoint, and it's hard for me to step out of that into somebody else's viewpoint. So, you know, we have this egocentric viewpoint of what we see in terms of the uh, geocentric universe. Uh, on top of that, you know, we feel like we're the center of our own universe. A uh, nice quote here, the world surrounds man as a circle surrounds one point. Well, that was easy to believe when we thought, Maybe the universe was built for us. So we fall for uh, naive realism for the exact same reasons and more that I'll get to. So these lead to the false beliefs that we hold uh, about the world and knowledge and false interpretations of reality. And my cat Viper thinks that she's the center of the universe, so I like that picture. So, you know, when we think about which reality we should be considering, why privilege human perception? Well, we talked about egocentrism, anthropocentrism. It's the only perspective that we have. I mean, it's hard to see the world through the body of a bat. That's pretty difficult, or through the body of a cockroach. We have human exceptionalism, just like American exceptionalism. We think we're better than other species, obviously, because we eat them and we object when they eat us. And misunderstanding evolution is a big part of the problem. So naive realism is not correct. And uh, senses are an interface. 
and that interse interface has been shaped by evolution. So we're going to need to understand a little bit about evolution. And in particular, what does evolution do? It promotes fitness. So it's been shaped, our perceptions have been shaped to promote fitness, not capture reality necessarily. So, you know, this idea of the computer uh, linked to the brain, maybe like the matrix or something like that. You know, what's its what is it transmitting? Like I said, it's not transmitting color, shape, and movement. In this case, it's just transmitting zeros and ones. And it's pretty much the same for us. It's just neurons firing, okay? You've got analog receptors in the eye, but once that information leaves the eye, it's nothing but neurons that either fire or they don't fire. So I was a software engineer in a previous life. So literally, uh, the word black cat with that uh, capitalization is this sequence of zeros and ones, right? This looks nothing like a black cat. It looks nothing like the words black cat, and it doesn't convey the meaning black cat. But that's the way the computer uh, codes that. And similarly, what goes from the eyes to the back of the head or from the ears uh, to the cortices are like that. So reality is not what we think. I couldn't help the metaphor, point out the metaphors from three weeks ago. Our grasp on reality is not as tight as we think it is. And uh, so two disconnections uh, that fool us, I'm going to talk about tonight, is that perception is weighted by fitness value and that you project or simulate most of reality because, as it says, your life depends on it. I had a list of four, but I don't have that much time. So epistemology, I had this slide last time, the theory of knowledge, what distinguishes true belief from mere opinion, and why do we think the way we think? What is truth? What is reality? All of these are issues that fall under epistemology, which the last talk and this talk fall under that category. So a lot of what we talk about with this disconnect, um, the, no the first, actually both the disconnections I'm going to talk about, not all the material comes from these two books, but these two books are very influential uh, in my thinking. So The Case Against Reality uh, by Donald Hoffman and then Anil Seth's book, Being You. So this is a very famous quote for people who are interested in evolution. Nothing in biology makes se sense except in the light of evolution. And I buy that completely. But being a little more humble, uh, that epistemic humility, nothing makes complete sense except in the light of evolution, including psychology. And I completely believe that. So you know we've got evolutionary biology, but we have evolutionary psychology as well. And this talk is kind of a mix of the two. So that goes along with my thesis here that knowledge and perception can't be understood without appreciating evolution and also appreciating development. And they go together because how does evolution work? It changes the developmental process through genes. So a little disclaimer here. Um, if I say anything unsettling, remember I'm talking science. I'm not talking morality. So uh, there might be some things that I mentioned that are, are not to be interpreted as moral edicts or justifications for the way the world is or for the way people behave. Um, it's just a, a matter of um, science. So, I mean, infanticide and sexual coercion exist in probably every uh, culture and certainly in other species, but that doesn't justify them, that doesn't make them right. So David Hume, back in the 1700s, did a great job of distinguishing between the is and the ought. The is is the facts of the world, the science. And that doesn't mean we ought to behave that way, right? I mean, I mean we shouldn't, I mean, infanticide obviously is not an ought. So we have to come up with our odds on our own. Science might help us attain those, but it can't reveal what the odds should be for us. Um, again, this distinction between morality, if you see a coyote take down a, a rabbit, you, know, you don't think, oh boy, you're going to coyote hell, you're gonna be punished for that, right? Or you need to go to coyote jail. So natural selection is one part of evolution. It's kind of what gives it a direction. And we talk about selection pressures. So again, a metaphor. They're selecting out members of the species and they're pressures to survival, like things that can kill you, freezing to death in Alamosa or dying from heat exposure or anything that uh, reduces reproduction, like poor mate choice is a selection pressure. There's a selection pressure for any species to pick better mates as opposed to poorer mates. So not a moral definition, a scientific definition is what is good in evolution is survival and reproduction What's bad is anything that decreases survival or decreases reproduction. So perceptions are tuned to these specific perceptions or uh, pressures that we have. So because of that, we've evolved so that things that are good from the evolutionary perspective are pleasurable. You know, we have positive emotions and positive feelings. 
things that are bad, un, uh, negative emotions and unpleasant feelings. So sex is very good from an evolutionary perspective. It's all about gene replication. Can't do that without sex, except some species, asexual reproduction, uh, et cetera. So sex is pleasant. A wound is bad, it's threatening to your life, so it feels bad, right? And, yep. So here's an example of how evolution works. This is a gross simplification, I realize. But imagine we had 100 uh, human beings on Earth at one point. 50 of them had the genes that made them think that sex feels good. 50 of them thought sex feels neutral. Not even bad, just neutral. Well, if we pair them up, so we've got 25 couples on each side, the couples that think sex feels good are gonna have more babies, so, and fewer babies over here. So in the second generation, we might end up with 130, so we've gone from 50% pro-sex genes to 77%. One more generation of that, we get to 92%. One more generation, we get to 97%. And in a few generations, everybody pretty much agrees that eh, sex is all right. Um, and you know, this is a gross oversimplification, but then again, evolution's been working on multicellular organisms for half a billion years. So we've got you know, millions of generations of millions of members of every species. It, it, the advantages can be much smaller and they accrue over time. So last time I talked about the correspondence theory of knowledge, the idea that our knowledge matches reality. Obviously I'm arguing against that. And you know, tonight focusing on perception. So if we ask, is this graduate's uh, gown blue, a child and many adults would say yes, which is naive realism. A physicist says no, there's no color out there. Color only happens in the brain. What happens is uh, this reflects a different wavelength and that wavelength is interpreted a certain way by your brain. And the psychologist says yes and no. So uh, if a tree falls in the forest, similar question, you know, and no, no animals around, does it make a sound? When I was 18, I thought this was the dumbest question ever, right? Of course it makes a sound, right? It's gonna vibrate those air molecules whether anybody's around or not. Yeah, it does, but vibrating air molecules are not sound. You need something to receive those vibrations and interpret those vibrations. So John Locke and, and others uh, realized that these, uh, they, called, they referred to primary qualities, things that would be mind independent versus mind dependent qualities uh, or secondary qualities that again, only exist because of brains. So pleasure and pain fall in there, smell and taste. So again, this would be mind dependent reality. So dependent on brains, and again, brains get shaped by evolution. So if color is not a quality of objects, why do we perceive it? Thanks for asking. Which is more functional? The monochrome monitor? I was a software engineer in a previous life. I worked on monitors like that. I worked on punch cards versus this nice interface that we all use. I mean, your phone is so much more efficient than, than that thing over there, right? It's more functional. So if it's more functional, you get more done. So again, imagine we have got 50 members uh, of the species that see in color, 50 that don't. The ones that see in color, it's more functional uh, in ways that I'll describe later. So they're more likely to survive. If you survive, you're gonna produce more offspring. So I just use the same numbers. After a few generations, everybody perceives in color. So uh, I wanna talk about these myths of evolution before we move into the actual material because it shows us like the Ptolemaic uh, view, the geocentric universe, it, it uh, shows us why we have some of these misperceptions that we have. You know, we think that our perceptions are special. So there's the list, but I'm gonna go through each one of these. So I won't waste time on this slide. Uh, myth number one is that evolution requires a, a designer or foreknowledge, but that's not the case. Uh, William Paley, when was that, early 1800s, said, if you're walking on the beach, I think it was a beach, and you find a watch, something that complex, you look at it and you know somebody made it. So when you see a human eye, something that complex, you know somebody made it, somebody designed it. And that's not the case. So Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker, and that's what evolution is. Evolution is a blind designer. Evolution can't know what will be adaptive in the future. It doesn't know it and it doesn't need to. Here's the facts. The future is generally like the past. We've lived with predators for millions of years. We've lived with foods or, or substances that could poison us and freeze to death and, and all those things. What is adaptive today is probably adaptive tomorrow because of the continuity. 
the better adapted members of any species today are going to survive more frequently. They're going to reproduce and their offspring are going to be similar to their parents. So the prevalence of a trait changes. And that's the definition of evolution, the diagrams that I had, right, with four generations. So um, we can go back and think about fast rabbits and slow rabbits. 50% of the population has genes for being fast. And again, I didn't change the numbers. In a few generations, fast rabbits get more prevalent. And it doesn't require a guiding hand, just fast predators. That's the selection pressure. That's what's shaping um, the proportions of genes in the environment uh, in the future. So there's no designer needed. The wrong way to think about this is to think future-oriented, to say evolution made fast rabbits because it will enable them to evade prey. No, that's not right. The correct way is to look at history and the past. Natural selection killed off slow rabbits, leaving fast rabbits who had fast babies, right? Because of genes, offspring are like their parents. Uh, number two, there is no such thing as an objective, ideal, environment independent adaptation. Every adaptation has to be a match to a given environment. So eyes are really helpful. Vision is a great thing. But if you live underground, you don't need eyes. And so evolution you know, doesn't produce eyes in subterranean animals. Even animals that used to have eyes and switched over, like fish that got isolated in caves, these uh, cave fish, lose their eyes over time because there's no advantage to them. So why maintain them? Brains are expensive. Perception is expensive. Just try buying a brain on eBay. Maybe not. The FBI might knock at your door. Um, but yeah, brains are very expensive. They take a huge amount of our metabolic needs. For about 2% of our body mass, it's like 30%, 20 to 30% of our calories. Uh, camouflage is a perfect example. It has to match the environment. You switch the polar bear and the grizzly bear, uh, switch them in the opposite environments, and they stick out like a sore thumb. Here we have two moths. Obviously, the dark-colored moth is way better adapted to that environment. So when we talk about an adaptation, there's no ideal uh, adaptation. You can't evaluate an adaptation outside of the environment in which it occurs. Um, the idea that there's one direction, uh, not the band, but that there's one direction to evolution or to any set of traits that we're always moving forward, whatever forward would mean. Well, the future isn't always like the past. We evolved in Africa in that environment, and you don't see junk food in that environment over there 70,000 years ago. But now we live in this environment where we're surrounded by foods that are killing us. Obesity has gone up dramatically. Diabetes has gone up dramatically. Cancers, coronary heart disease. So it's likely the case that um, people who have genes that predispose them to problems with things like obesity and coronary heart disease are dying at higher rates. So we could over time evolve away from liking sugar so much. We could become less addicted to sugar, or there could be some other adaptation, you know, greater willpower or whatever, it doesn't matter. But the point is, when the environment changes, something that's adaptive may no longer be adaptive anymore. And our preferences for food are not adaptive uh, in our current environment, at least some of our preferences. Uh, the myth that uh, evolution <laughs> um, creates perfection the eye is a great example. The eye is amazing, but it's a mess. The uh, light comes in through the pupil and hits the photoreceptors. These are the rods and cones that do black and white and color in the very back. But the image is upside down because of the way a lens works. So the brain has to flip it over. The brain has to do that extra step. On top of that, all these uh, neurons assemble and a nerve is just lots of neurons or axons of neurons. So there's about 200,000 uh, axons that go out the back of your eyeball and you have a blind spot in both eyes because of it. And if you haven't done this, seriously, go home and Google it. It's amazing. You can put two marks on a piece of paper. They give you the instructions. You mess with it. You're like seeing two marks and all of a sudden, boom, one of them just goes away. And if it's a white sheet of paper, you see white where that image was. If it's a blue sheet of paper, you see blue where that image was. Your brain fills in the blind spot. So not a great design and it gets worse. Like I said, the receptors are back here, and then we have two layers of, uh, of neurons that are changing the wavelengths to zeros and ones, to neurons firing or not firing. 
And that is what goes through the optic nerve. So this is like having your computer screen or your TV screen having a transparent wire coming out of every single pixel out of the front of the screen and then going through a hole in the screen. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? No, no fifth grader would choose a design like that. And it's a pretty good argument against intelligent design. And there are many others that you can find uh, if, you look at, um, if you look at biology. The idea that we're a pinnacle species, really? You know, whether it's nuclear holocaust that gets us or whether it's climate change or whatever happens, I'm pretty sure cockroaches are gonna outsurvive us. For every sense, there are species that are superior to us. We're not the fastest, we're not the strongest, we're not the biggest, we're not the most armored, don't have the biggest claws, insulation, camouflage. What do humans have going for us? Big brains and social structure and language, <laughs> especially when we write it down, right? We learn from previous generations. But, you know, as adaptations, we're pretty unimpressive. Um, going along with this, you know, the pinnacle species thing, we only see a tiny little slice of what's out there. Of all these wavelengths of light, this is all we see. So when we talk about Roy G. Biv, this is that tiny little bit. Uh, hawks can see four to eight times better than we can see. Animals can hear wavelengths we can't. So we have humans here at the top. And notice this is a logarithmic scale. This isn't you know, equal interval. This is 10x every jump. So I did the calculations for you here. Your dog can hear twice as many uh, wavelengths uh, as you can, and a dolphin seven and a half times what you can hear. So again, lots of animals are way better than us, so why should we privilege our perception? So these myths mislead us to think that we're special and to do just that, to think that our perception is perfect, no way, that our perception is privileged, no. Um, so again, it's a, an analogy to that uh, Earth-centered model, it just, we fall prey for the same reasons, plus even more, because of the evolution thing and thinking that we're the best. So <clears throat> when we talk about these multiple realities and these multiple ways of perceiving the world, there's a facile argument that best is accurate. And four years ago in class, I, would have arg I did argue that. We, I use an article where they talk about that. You know, when it comes to perceiving what other people think of you, accurate perception has to be the best, of course. But no, it's not the case. Um, if accurate perception is black and white or grayscale, you know, which is more functional? Color is more functional. So um, best is not equal to accurate. So how do we define accurate? That's a good question. And I kind of dug into Huffman's view on this. And he usually gets very mathematical so that they can actually test this experimentally or with computer simulations. But I mean, think about it this way, basically seeing the world in a, a neutral sense, not enhanced, so all objects are perceptually equal uh, when you're born. Uh, after all, objects are just bundles of subatomic particles. So emotionally, there's no preloaded good, bad preference, what's desirable. We, don't, we wouldn't see color. Um, we wouldn't pay more attention to something that's moving than something that's static. You know, th this book sitting here versus somebody running into the room would garner equal attention. Motivationally, there's no innate approach avoidance. So if we're looking at a rock tree, flower, or rattlesnake, it's all the same to us, uh, initially anyway. Foods, berries, straw, whatever, chocolate cake, rotting carcasses, it's all the same to us. And you know, this idea of the blank slate that I shot down last time <coughs> uh, could be a way that you could start with this neutral perception, and you'd have to learn or deduce what's good or bad, and that would be incredibly inefficient. So that's kind of the model when we're comparing our version versus accurate perception. This is kind of what I have in mind for accurate, and it's, like I said, similar to Donald Hoffman's perspective. So he argues in the book, The Case Against Reality, what I've said, that perceptions are tuned to selection pressures, but in particular that the best is not equal to accurate. So that what we are actually seeing is fitness value assessments. What does this mean for my survival or reproduction? So we have emotional reactions from boo to yay or yuck to yum. We have behavioral tendencies of uh, void to approach. And when they look at this, accurate loses every time. Looking at the way we perceive reality or anything like that compared to an accurate. Um, he was working with another mathematician. I haven't reviewed the mathematical proof, but apparently there's a mathematical proof that if you operationalize these in formulas, that accurate loses every time. 
Maybe more interesting is evolutionary game theory. What they do with evolutionary game theory is a programmer sets up these entities on your computer, you know, just like an avatar or something like that, and you can create different species that have different characteristics that are turned over from generation to generation, just like we do with genes. And then there are different environments and different selection pressures. And his exact phrase is that evolution drives accuracy to extinction every time. In any computer model they've done, many, many simulations, accurate loses every time. So part of the gain that we get is seeing less than reality. So reality, or uh, our, our perception, hides reality from us. So again, I'm going to compare computers and humans. If you think about computers, we have electrical signals. And then we have all these levels of abstraction that make it easier. I used to be a software engineer. So you know, I showed you the bits for black cat. Well, here's the bits for 119, uh, the number 119. These are the bits for a W. Uh, this is machine code. It would take you forever to write an email, um, et cetera. And, but what we deal with uh, is a GUI, a graphical user interface. So you know, we can just click on that icon for the Word document, drag it to the recycle bin, and it disappears, right? So all this detail is hidden from us, which saves us a ton of time. It's much more efficient. If anybody wants to send me an email in binary, don't bother. I'm not going to decode it. Humans are the same way. We're dealing with subatomic particles. But we have all these layers. Even when we get up to the uh, level of objects, right? this is mostly empty space. So we're not perceiving reality. And it would be very dysfunctional for us to perceive individual atoms in empty space. What we perceive are objects with these perceptual qualities, like color and other things I'll talk about. On top of that, beyond the perceptual qualities, they also have these effects of driving our attention, our emotions, and our motivation. So we have this human reality interface that sort of parallels the human computer interface. And again, a huge gain is by hiding all the generally unnecessary detail. We can't see that level of reality. So I want to drive the point home uh, about fitness value assessments. What do I mean? Imagine you pull up to a stoplight, it's just turned red, so you know you're going to be there for a minute or two, and you look out the window and there's a penny on the ground. Do you jump out of the car and grab that penny? I'm probably not going to do that. A dime? Probably not going to do that. I'm going to get the 20, and the Ben Franklin, for sure, I'm jumping out of the car to get that. Right? So this is what we mean. We mean economic value here. Well, imagine you're at that same stoplight, and across the intersection, there are people out there giving away free samples for a new restaurant. And you're like, oh, man, should I pull over for a free sample of raw bamboo? Probably not going to do that. Nice bowl of grass. Doesn't sound too tasty. Plain pasta? Maybe if I'm really hungry, but the hot fudge sundae, I'm, I'm pulling over for sure for a free hot fudge sundae. So this is what we mean by fitness value, one, one form of fitness value. So you know, we've got this socially constructed value over here. Paper money doesn't, has no inherent worth. And this stuff has no inherent worth, but for our species it does. Calories has a lot of worth for us. We die without them. Does that kind of make sense, what we're talking about here with fitness value? So let me give you some examples of fitness value assessments. These are my grandsons. Give me an honest answer. Are they cute? No, they're not. What about the kitty? Is the kitty cute? I tell them they're the cutest. They're the cutest in the world. I love them to death. They're the cutest in the world to me. The kitty? Babies aren't inherently cute. Evolution has tricked our brains into thinking that babies are cute. It's not an objective quality, just like color is not an objective quality of this piece of paper. Cuteness is not an objective quality. Of, of anything. Cuteness does not exist without human brains. But people who hate babies and don't think they're cute make fewer babies and fewer baby-hating genes. So people who think babies are cute are more likely to have babies, and that's why virtually everybody thinks neoteny, baby-like features, is cute. So I'm going to wait till about their fifth birthday. I figure they'll be old enough for this presentation by then, and I'll explain to them that I tell them they're cute, but they're really not, so don't let it go to your head. I'm joking. But offspring are literally the definition of evolutionary fitness, right? It's not big muscles, thankfully for me. Um, well, I don't went out here either. I've only got one child of my own. But evolutionary fitness is the number of viable uh, offspring that you have. That is the definition of uh, evolutionary fitness. 
So, you know, evolution has tuned us to see things that are going to promote fitness and promote babies. Uh, what about tasty? Which looks better? I kind of like the chocolate cake, right? Our ancestors that lived on bamboo or low calorie foods or didn't stay away from poisons didn't produce many babies or many genes. But sugar is not inherently sweet. Without a brain and taste buds, that's just a bunch of molecules. So sweet is not an objective quality. We are not seeing objective reality. We're seeing a mind-dependent reality that's been shaped by evolution to promote our survival and reproduction. Which is more disgusting, the chocolate cake or the dung beetle rolling its ball of poop? Well, disgust is not inherent, right? Gross is not inherent. Disgust is a, a fantastic evolutionary adaptation. It keeps us away from pee and poop and pus and rotting carcasses and things that would make us sick or kill us. So uh, it's, it's very obvious, you know, again, if we took 50 members of the species that had a disgust reaction and 50 that didn't, you know, we can guess at who's going to survive. What about attractive? The features that correlate with physical and reproductive health are the things that we see as attractive. So, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, a little bit. Beauty is culturally defined, a little bit. But there are many universals in what's attractive. I mean, which, which eye is more attractive to you, right? So this is an indicator of health. My daughter's a nurse, and <laughs> I showed her this, and she's like, oh, man, that person's either in renal failure or they've got some other very serious problem going on, right? Signs of masculinity. For reasons I can go into in detail, I'll just say that what's puberty all about? Puberty is all about making us sexually viable. That happens through the sex hormones. The same sex hormones that make you sexually viable are the ones that also account for secondary sex characteristics, characteristics that aren't directly involved uh, in reproduction, like a square jaw and facial hair and breasts and hips and things like that. So there are signs that you got a good dose of hormones so that you're slightly more likely to be uh, reproductively viable. Or, or, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, optimal age. There's an optimal age for reproduction, and that optimal age isn't 80, right? So age correlates for, with fertility for men and women, and I'm 63. I'm not arguing for ageism here, right? And again, my you know, moral disclaimer. This is facts. This is not how the world should necessarily be. But the probability of successful pregnancy for women changes drastically by decade. You know, and once you hit menopause, it's, it's over. That's the definition of menopause. And uh, again, this might be harsh, but it explains a lot about societies. Men's reproductive viability is not nearly as affected by age because sperm are reproduced all the time, every single second. But a female is born with all the ova she's ever going to have. So if you're 50 years old, you're over 50 years and four months old or something like that. So... You know, it's just a harsh fact. And uh, again, you know, if we look at probabilities, if we look at generation after generation, this accounts for the preferences that we develop. But not everything's blanket. Uh, evolution, I'm not talking about genetic determinism here. A lot of people, especially if you remember the days of sociobiology, think that all oh, this is hardwired into our bodies and there's no room, you know, to uh, react to the environment. And that's just not the case. Evolutionary psychology, like I said, there's no such thing as an adaptation or you can't judge an adaptation outside of its environment. So, you know, when you're dehydrated, you have the sensation of thirst, maybe even a headache, fluid looks appealing, so your behavior is to drink. Conversely, if you're stuffed after eating a whole lot, food looks unappealing and you stop eating, unless you're Mr. Creosote from Monty Python. Does anybody get that reference? Yeah, okay, so he eats until he literally explodes. All right, so <clears throat> um, I'm going to go back to the interface thing uh, argument a little bit. We can operationalize this so that it's actually testable, measurable in scientific studies. Functional, in this case, means fast recognition and efficient manipulation. You know, that's much easier here than on a monochrome monitor. We can break it down more. Efficient means fast, not just recognition, but fast actions, low energy, and few mistakes. If you're dealing with bits, all zeros and ones, it's really easy to make mistakes, and it's incredibly slow and takes a lot of energy and a ton of time. So icons on a computer are efficient via schemas that I talked about last time. Schemas are our mental blueprints. So color helps us identify different icons, different objects, different types of files or folders. 
the shape of the icon, the image. Word has its own image. It has its own color and image versus Excel. All of those are for fast identification. Location on your desktop may help you. Depends on the interface or how you have your desktop set up. Well, I mean, even just picking it so that you always use the same locations helps you. And function, how do we use them? Because evolution, knowing stuff doesn't matter in and of itself, per se. Um, recognizing things doesn't matter. What matters is that we have to operate on our environment. We have to take actions, motor actions, on our environment or in response to our environment, like approach or avoidance. So function is ultimately the most important thing that we do. Motor behavior um, is what keeps us surviving. And as I said last talk, everything's metaphorical. We're not dealing with the reality of bits. When you drag a file to the garbage can, you're dragging an icon to an icon. That icon is not the file. It's not the bits, right? Absolutely not. It's just an image. And the uh, garbage can or recycle bin is not a garbage can. And when you drag it over there, you have deleted the file, but you haven't really deleted the file. It's all still there. Uh, usually it's all still there on the disk. You've just broken the links to go find it. So it's not literal, but it's really easy because all this detail is hidden for you, right? Um, hides that unneeded detail. It's easy to manipulate. And again, if you had to delete one file uh, by coding binary zeros and ones, it would take you days. Same thing with the human reality interface. We can use the same definitions. So color, what does color do for us? Well, it grabs our attention. It helps with identification and locating things. So imagine being super hungry, no animals around. You recognize the plant. Maybe there are berries over there. And it's all grayscale. There's gray berries against gray leaves against gray ground, right? Color helps us survive. Um, figure ground, uh, ho hopefully everybody's familiar with this. You all are the figure, and the chairs, and the carpet, and the walls are the ground. You're what matters to me right now, right? So the figure ground relationship shows up in infancy right away. But on top of that, I mean, that helps us identify what matters, but on top of that, our attention as human beings is drawn to other people and to animals and just in general things that move. So when you look at a landscape like this, you're more focused on the animals. You're probably not staring at the blades of grass or the trees. When you look at this park, you look immediately at the people and not just the people, you look at the faces. And again, this can be experimentally tested with eye tracking software. I mean, it has been tested. So let me take a little side, uh, give you an example of how this shows up. When cameras started out, we had black and white film, right? Maybe that's closer to mind independent reality, but we don't want that. We want our normal reality, so we develop color film to imitate our human interface. And some people say, wait, Jeff, look, that must be reality because my camera, you know, there's no brain in my camera. I take a picture and I see color. Yeah, you see color because we developed color, the chemicals to produce the colors that reproduce what our brain produces, right? That's what we've done. It's not that the camera is capturing color. It's just the chemicals are reacting in a way that they produce wavelengths that then our brain interprets. Um, and it gets crazier. Smart cameras, what do they do? They identify and focus on faces now, right? That's pretty amazing technology. It's a program imitation of what we do naturally, of what evolution has produced in us because it's functional. We've produced that in cameras. We have motion control in our bodies uh, in many different ways, just in, in visual. In fact, I'll show you an example later on. And you know, now there are cameras that have motion control when you're taking a video or something like that. So we've uh, created technology in our own image, technology to suit us. So uh, again, we're talking about fast recognition and uh, efficient interaction. So these icons are network schemas. And, and again, a schema is basically a blueprint. You know, you've got a schema for a snake and a cat and a dog and for love and war and everything else. And these are all networks of neurons in your brain in different regions of your brain. So you've got regions of your brain that have perceptual schemas. I've got a schema to recognize the snake. I've got emotion schemas, areas in your brain that just are generating emotion. Motivations, approach or avoid. And the motor, uh, uh, the motor schemas, how to interact with a particular thing. And last and least, 
is the semantic, the meaning, the definition, naming the object or putting a category on it. Our brains are wired so that we can feel fear and then you say, what was it? I mean, if you step on a snake, you may jump backwards in fear and then say, oh, it was a snake or it was just a stick, right? And the, I, I won't go into it, but your brain has dual paths and the one that wires your reaction is faster than the one that wires recognition. So motor schemas, just as an example, um, if I'm going to grab this apple to pick it off a tree, I'm going to grab it a different way than if I'm going to eat it. I'm going to grab it a different way if I'm going to whip it at quarry, and I'm going to grab it a different way if I wanted to catch it, right? Or if I'm going to juggle. So we have to learn those, but we learn those in concert, and all of these are cross-wired together so that when you see a snake, your motor schema of get the hell out of there um, reacts very quickly. So again, this creates a very efficient thing. And when Hoffman talks about this parallel between computer icons, you know, the, the icon for the Word document is similar to your icon for a rattlesnake, right? It, it, it's, it's not literal, but it embodies a lot of information. The recognition and, how to, and, and emotionally, the motivation and the motor reaction. So learning from mistakes is a wonderful way to learn unless it kills you. So it's better to be born preloaded and you know, I talked about the philosophy side last uh, lecture. This is the example of nativism. Nativism is that we're not born a blank slate, uh, that we come preloaded to some uh, degree. And when we talk about human nature, if you're talking about human nature as in this is universal, everybody around the world experiences it, that has to go back to genes and it has to go back to evolution. That's what you're talking about when you, if, if you're using human nature in that way. So he says it's good to look at reality as fitness icons are associated with the emotion and motivation. So any sort of threat is a broad category. We feel fear and we go into avoidance mode. Poisons, we experience disgust and we avoid them. A social threat, like uh, being rejected, you feel social pain and you try to repair the situation. Uh, motion garners more attention than a static object, right? I mean, this book is unlikely to cause me harm right now. You know, but you all move, or a car crashing through the window um, is moving. So animals move, we pay more attention to things that move. You know, if you're sitting there and there's nothing happening and something's still and something, suddenly there's a movement, you immediately orient to it in a, in a reactive way with no thought. You don't have to plan that. So going back to some of these adaptations, not all sounds elicit equal emotion. You know, the drone of a lawnmower, you might be able to shut that out, but you know, your screaming baby for a parent, forget about it. Um, not all feelings elicit equal emotion or action. Pain is, you know, the epitome of a functional adaptation. We, we'd have a hard time surviving without the physical pain mechanism. And, and some people don't have that and they do hurt themselves. So I had a long section on this that I cut out, but when it comes to rationality, almost all of this is completely unconscious. We don't understand how it operates. You know, how do we do what we do? I, I can't tell you how I move my finger. I just think about it and it happens. So these other things, these perceptual things, uh, we don't understand that. The function, we don't always realize the function of these adaptations or why we like what we like or why we do what we do. I mean, going back to attractiveness, the white eye, that's, that's sclera. So nice, white, clear sclera is healthy. Bright eyes is a sign of youth, you know, the glimmering eye. Um, what is it, the liminal ring is, uh, is also more apparent in people who are healthier and younger. So I don't know how many of you put this on your match.com uh, profile, but I'm looking some, with somebody with white sclera, a nice liminal ring, and whatever else I just said. Facial symmetry, right? We don't even know these things. I, I put that on my site, and that's why I didn't get any responses, maybe. Um, just kidding. Uh, they're beyond our control for the most part. You can't stop seeing color. It's really hard to stop being disgusted. You might habituate to something, you know. I didn't used to like eel sushi, and now I love it. But uh, in general, it takes a while. Uh, or appreciating attractiveness, right? It doesn't stop when your fitness goals have been met. Oh, I've had my kids. No more sex for me. I have no interest. No one looks attractive. I have no interest in sex anymore because I've got my 2.2 kids. It doesn't work that way. Evolution's not that precise. So in some sense, it's illogical. Um, for some of these things to continue on in just some sense. I mean, there are other values to sex like pair bonding, so that you stick around to raise your kids. So again, a lot of this is hidden. We've got the threshold of consciousness, uh, very Freudian, but it's true. Um, 
much of what we do, like moving my finger, or why do I like what I like, why do I choose what I choose, is beyond introspection. You know, we encourage people to be introspective, know thyself, but there's a limit to it. Because of this interface, all this stuff is hidden from us. So we're clueless about lots of things, um, like why we do what we do and like what we like, et cetera. More than 90% of thought is non-conscious. I mean, most estimates are 98 to 99%. 90% um, of thought is top-down, which is my next topic, projection and prediction. We're not dwelling on what's coming in. We're projecting our expe expectations. And consciousness can be wrong in many cases, while other areas of the brain are right. So consciously, you can be faked out by an optical illusion, and your motor system isn't faked out. You see two objects and you say, you know, two apples, and because of an optical illusion, one looks bigger. And when you reach for them, you reach the exact same way, because those are separate networks in your brain. So consciousness, sometimes, we think consciousness is the greatest, right? But sometimes it's not. So consciousness is a very small part of our lives, but it's the part that we see, right? <laughs> it's, it's like the tip of the iceberg setting up, you know? This is the important stuff down here, and uh, this is where we're stuck. So all of this kind of goes along with the message from this uh, uh, famous painting, uh, this is not a pipe. It's not. It's a painting of a pipe. Actually, today, it's not a painting of a pipe. It's a projected image of a bunch of zeros and ones on the disk. It's certainly not a pipe. So you can take this to two levels. Perception always intercedes between reality and ourselves, right? You know, you're not looking through a window. You've got this filter. Or you've got this interface. And on top of that, it's easy to get faked down and forget that the map is not the territory. This is a map. This is McDaniels right over here. How many, how many people are parked in McDaniels parking lot right now? Gosh, that information is not helpful. I don't know, right? This is a map. It's not the thing. My perceptions are a map. They're not the thing. That pipe is not inside my head. And that color is only inside my head. It's not out there. So we confuse our models of reality with reality itself, a major point that I was trying to go at after last week with metaphor. All models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Lots of them are useful. Our perceptual models are generally useful. So again, our human reality interface uh, is metaphorical. It's enhanced perception and emotion. When we're searching for food, all these things help, color, smell, taste, but it's not literal. You don't have a calorie meter. You're just drawn to, generally, we're drawn to high calorie foods, sugar and fat, high protein foods, salt, because we need salt as well, even if it's not calories. Uh, the ease of use, seeing an object, triggers that motor schema, even if you don't intend to. If I watched you pick up this apple, that would trigger those same neurons in my brain, or similar neurons, through the mirror neuron mechanism. Hides unneeded detail, as I said, things like the figure ground relationship. And uh, yeah, we wouldn't want to be perceiving uh, molecules. So your perceptions are not the percepts. They're not the thing that's out there. So to summarize this section, and I see I'm running late, um, due to this human interface, we're perceiving what matters to survival and reproduction. So that elicits emotion more than something that doesn't matter. It aids our learning. Emotion aids learning, motivates our adaptive behaviors, and minimizes us wasting energy on something that's not valuable. I mean, just in general, we need to minimize wasted energy so we don't starve to death in our ancestral past, and for too many people, same today. Uh, we do that via prediction, which is the second uh, part of the talk. On the flip side, we barely perceive what doesn't matter to us, doesn't elicit emotion, so it's hard to learn about, or we don't need to learn much about it. We're not motivated, and that conserves free energy to ignore what doesn't matter. And we do that through this extensive prediction that I'm going to talk about. So, prediction. Reminds me, I was walking to school today, and I'm thinking about the talk, completely lost in what I'm doing, not paying attention to where I'm walking or where I'm stepping, and wouldn't you know it, I stepped on a giraffe. Thank you, good expression. So when I said that, all you psych majors were like, I know, that's a P600. So our brains work by electrochemical pulses, you know, that's what neurons are all about. So you can measure with an EEG, maybe you've had an EEG for some other reason, gone to the doctor, but at 600 milliseconds after the surprising or unexpected word, you get the surprise response. Well, you can't have a surprise unless you had some sort of prediction. You didn't know what I was gonna say I stepped on, 
But of all the possible things, you weren't thinking a giraffe here in Alamosa. A little too big to step on, right? Another uh, way that we all experience this is saccades. When you read, you don't read left to right across the page smoothly. Your eyes jump around the sentence back and forth. Even as I look out at you, my eyes are jumping around. And what happens is we don't get dizzy, we don't get confused, because your brain programs the jump and it turns off perception during the jump. If I'm making a big sweep with my eyes, you usually close your eye and open it at the new location so you don't get dizzy. Even if you keep it open, your brain sort of suppresses that input to keep you from getting dizzy. So it's doing prediction because it knows what it just programmed and it turns that off. Let me show you a counter example. Don't touch your eyeball, but just push on the skin at the base of your eye. Come on, play along. The world goes wonky, right? Your brain programmed that, but it doesn't have years and years of experience of doing that, so it can't compensate for that. So this is an example of prediction and adaptation. And the difference is that this one you can predict, this one you can't. So the majority of our mental processing is prediction or projection, like a couple slides back when I said 90%. We spend a lot of time reflecting on the past. We spend a lot of time planning for the future from milliseconds to decades. We simulate what we're going to say. Oh, I've got to talk to my boss. I can say that because she's not here. I've got to talk to my boss. I've got to think that one through before I approach her. Predicting what comes next. You know, I want to avoid an accident, and I wasn't predicting giraffe. So uh, Seth calls this uh, the idea that we have, the, basically what we're doing is a controlled hallucination. We're a Bayesian, if that means anything to you, it's a type of probability. We're a Bayesian prediction machine. Based on past experience, we're always predicting what's going to come next. And we only update it when there's a mismatch, okay? So uh, let me give you an example. Homeostasis is super important for us to not waste energy. We need to keep our bodies at a certain level in terms of heart rate and blood pressure and, and many different things, respiration, calories. Um, so it's kind of like a thermostat, right? You set your thermostat to 68 or whatever it is and the, tries the, your furnace tries to keep the room at that temperature. So imagine Beyonce here is at a state of homeostasis, and then she gets a bad review maybe on her latest CD. Hard to imagine. So she goes into a non-homeostatic state. She's emotionally upset. She's got elevated heart rate and blood pressure. She's burning energy unnecessarily. She does some mental coping. She remembers, I'm the queen. I've got more Grammys than any human being in the history of the world. And that makes her feel better, and she goes back to homeostasis. And this is what we do when there's a disturbance, when you're driving and something happens, and you react to it. Your heart rate goes up, and then you, know, you avoid the accident, and you return to homeostasis. Because if you didn't, you'd be burning a lot of energy. And it doesn't just happen naturally. You've got a sympathetic nervous system that boosts you, and a parasympathetic actually brings you back down. It's not like it just wears off. Your brain says, OK, bring it down. It's almost like turning on the air conditioning after the heater's gone too long. But we're better than that. What we do is allostasis. We react prior prior to the stressor in anticipation or preparation. So prevention is better than cure, right? I think we all have heard that term. So we're predicting the future to anticipate these changes and to avoid mistakes. And this goes back to what I said about energy. And there are a number of people who are pursuing this. There are models of how neurons in your brain minimize uh, excess firing. So we want to minimize the cost of surprise. And we do this from, via this prediction. So like I said, milliseconds to years. So here's an example of milliseconds. You're meditating or done with yoga and you're relaxing. You're at homeostasis, low heart rate, low blood pressure. And you think to yourself, I better stand up. What happens next? Your body reacts, physiological adjustments to raise your, uh, elevate your heart rate and blood pressure prior to the motor routine of standing. Because if you didn't, you'd get dizzy and pass out and maybe fall over and hit your head and get hurt. So you maintain homeostasis by making the changes before the stressor. You know, standing up, gravity, if you do it too fast, you do get dizzy, right? I would imagine we've all experienced that. But under normal conditions, your body avoids that by anticipation. This is allostasis to maintain homeostasis. Um, hours, you know, you're planning a long trip with your uh, significant other, and you think, well, you know, we've got to drive 200 miles, uh, I better check the tank of gas, because if I run out, you know, I could die in the heat or the cold. There's effort of hitchhiking or walking to the gas station. There's the risk of getting hit by a car. 
We're picked off by a wild deer in Alamosa. Uh, there might be anger and an argument. We break up. I don't want that, so I'm going to anticipate. And I'm going to put in the effort ahead of time. I'm going to fill the tank ahead of time. So I'm expending effort now to avoid these problems later. And yeah, energy and risk are minimized, and divorce is avoided, and the world's a happy place, right? So this isn't as automatic. Obviously, this is conscious and premeditated, but it is a, a similar example. You know, look at the costs here of a serious prediction error. You know, it's everything, time, energy, money, injury, death. So <clears throat> because we're projecting, it affects our perceptions. And again, this is another reason why we don't see reality. Does anybody see a triangle on the screen? Maybe two triangles on the screen? How many triangles are on the screen? Zero, right? There are zero complete triangles, but we see it just because of our past experience. This Bayesian idea, based on past experience, we predict what is out there and see things that aren't out there. Um, which side is concave? Cave means going inward. Yeah, does everybody agree this is concave and this is convex coming out at you? Why? Why do you see that? The shading. Well, why does that shading mean, why does the shading on one mean concave and the other convex? The lights are above us, the sun is above us, the moon is above us. We've lived with years and years and years of seeing this from above, so it's a clue. I mean, this is a two-dimensional surface, but you perceive it as dimensional because of your past experience. Uh, my daughter uses this as an example in a science fair in like fifth grade. And if you invert that, the world looks weird and you get the horror effect, the Halloween face. Projection also affects memory. So I'm gonna give you a little memory test here. Don't get stressed, it's very easy. Two little things to memorize on the next two slides. Everybody ready? Concentrate. What'd they say? Once upon a, a time, you saw what you expected to see. Just like proofreading, it's hard to read your own work because you know what you meant to write. It's, better, it's much better to have somebody else proofread your work for you. So expectations come from memory, and we call this top-down processing. The top is long-term memory, and the bottom is stuff coming from the senses from the world. And what we do is, oh yeah, she used this, uh, both of those in another science fair uh, study. And the first graders, it's because you're a good reader that you were fooled. Because of your experience, you were fooled. Because the, uh, the first graders were like, shot in the, the dark? <laughs> They're reading so slowly that they don't get faked out. What we're doing is we're getting bits of information from our senses. And again, this is a Neil Sess thing about we're projecting a Bayesian prediction that we're updating when there's a prediction error, when there's something we didn't expect to see. So you see just part of this. If you just see shot the dark, you fill in shot in the dark because you have that there. So it's a predictive match between bits of reality and your memory. So you're perceiving what's already in your mind. You're projecting that that's what's out there in the world when it isn't. Swipe texting is an example. It's predictive, it's error correcting, and it's projection. You know, It might give you alternate words, especially when you're as sloppy as I am, right? Um, Siri voice recognition, same thing. So once again, we've created technology in our own image, right? It's like, wow, the brain works this way. Wouldn't it be nice if my cell phone worked this way? So um, I am running over. Uh, all of this is about minimizing uh, energy. So imagine driving home from work. It's predictive projection. If you've done it a bunch of time, times, it's so minimal, you don't even remember. Gosh, you know, there were five stop lights, but I was busy thinking, did I stop at those? Did I go through them? Did I do the right thing? Yeah, of course you did, but you don't even remember it. Minimal stress, minimal energy. But if you're driving in another country, maybe driving in the opposite side of the road, dense traffic, signs you can't read, a lot of energy, a lot of attention and stress involved. If you've traveled a lot, you know, you travel to a foreign country, why is vacation so exhausting? Because you're out of your element, right? That's exactly what's going on here. And you're not minimizing that free energy that you do when you're at home in your everyday environment. So we only notice these things when they're errors. The giraffe example, the eye example, um, bump into things, uh, knock things over, I got to reach for something and I don't quite have it right. Uh, if you bump into things, I don't want to get too bogged down, but you have a map of your memory in your motor cortex, in your uh, sensory cortex. So when I stub my toe, 
I thought that my foot was going to clear the corner of the couch, and it didn't, right? That's a prediction error. Um, this is a solid object. You don't need to see the back to know that it would hold water. Or not. I spent 30 seconds cutting that this morning. If you perceive something unusual, if you don't do automatic recognition, what happens? You get to any of these, you get an abrupt transition in attention. You're going from non-conscious automatic effortless processing, almost effortless processing, to consciousness, conscious processing that's slower and more energy, takes more energy. So I'm getting to the end here. Perception has severe limits. I hope you got that message. Much of reality is hidden from us. I said that eight times. Uh, I talked about the philosophical stuff last time. Empiricism is bottom-up, science-oriented. Empiricism has its limits. Last talk, I mostly trashed rationalism, the top-down. The skeptics, the ancient skeptics and today's skeptics were correct. We don't really know anything 100%. Um, even science doesn't uh, solve that for us. Mind-independent reality is probably unknowable. Capital T truth is probably impossible. Um, our, our human perceptual interface is like a GUI, a graphical user interface. So reverse engineering is probably doomed. You know, to, you know, I can look, you, you can have an Apple device and you can have a Microsoft device and you have something else and they all have some similarities in that graphical user interface. But you don't know what's going on underneath and you can't go back down and figure it out. Same thing with us. Like I said, with introspection, you can't figure that out. Um, some of this is based on stuff we didn't talk about uh, that I had to cut. But libertarian free will is the idea that you have total free will. Anything that you want to do, you can do. I, and I'm not talking about limits of society or anything like that, or the fact that I can't dunk a basketball. But among anything that I could do, I have free choice. That's impossible. I mean, psychology tells us there's no way that's true. Just the fact that so much is non-conscious, so much that affects your decisions, your preferences. If you don't know what's affecting your choices, how can that be a completely free choice? Absolutely can't be. Now, does any free will exist? I'm not so sure. I'm a skeptic on that one. So Sartre famously said, man is condemned to freedom, to be free. And science says, yeah, or maybe not, right? We're condemned to make choices. I, I mean, I agree with that, but whether or not it's a free will choice. And uh, I'll come back to this one in a second. Similarly, the self is an illusion. We perceive our internal states. We perceive what our brains are doing. We perceive consciousness and self through the same flawed mechanisms. Just like free will, we get faked out for something I talked about last time. We have this metaphor, the homunculus, the little person in your side of your head. That's the self. That's the decider. Do I eat the chocolate cake or do I stick with my diet? Gosh, I'm conflicted. But who's going to decide? Myself, my homunculus. But this is no answer. Who's inside his head and inside that person's head, right? It's turtles all the way down, if you know that reference. I talked about it last time. So it's because of metaphors and the limits of our introspection that we get faked out about things like the nature of the self and free will. So the solutions, think fitness, think function, think development, the Evo Devo perspective. Um, broader implications, again, epistemic humility. So I don't know shit. Uh, the best we can do is credence, probabilities. I think this is a better option than this. And, you know, I, I think that promotes being open-minded um, and having humility about your own positions, whether it's positions on religion or politics or foods or laws, anything. You can go on and on. Uh, epistemic humility is one of my favorite uh, terms that I've picked up in the last couple of years. So we need to adopt multiple perspectives. And this is a favorite quote of mine from John Stuart Mills, a uh, famous American philosopher and educator. He who knows only his side of the argument knows little of that. Um, and my favorite example of this is evolution. I am fairly sure that anybody who's ever, I, I know more arguments against evolution than probably anybody I've ever argued over evolution with. And I know why I dismiss those. But I know both sides, right? And if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, you know, what. What does your side believe? What, is, what are the planks of your platform? You know, um, and, and why do you believe that's better than the other side? Well, you're not going to be able to understand that unless you uh, try, right? So that's sort of my uh, wrap up here, along with a joke. So sorry I went over. Man, almost as bad as last time. Not quite. <laughs> At least I got through everything. Last week I, or three weeks ago, I didn't even get through everything. 
But uh, I love talking about this stuff, obviously. I'm happy to stick around if anybody has questions. If you got to run, I understand. Thanks. No questions? That was too much. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be, yes. Zai. Absolutely. Okay, so do you think in the future we create more emotions? Or we just think or we just think of words that better that are better understanding of emotions? Um there are multiple things that go on there. Culturally, for example, um, collectivistic cultures have more words for shame related emotions or self conscious emotions than we do. So culturally you can develop a more nuanced understanding of emotion. But at the same time, emotions are clearly an evolutionary adaptation. Name an emotion and I can tell you how it helps us survive and reproduce. There's no doubt about that. Um, but again, just like our uh, desire for high calorie foods could be killing us, think about things like road rage, right? I mean, it's one thing to live in a tribe where the worst thing you have is a spear or a rock to hit each other over the head. You know, now we have nuclear weapons, so you know, rage might be the end of our species, or road rage, you know, people are killing each other, mass shootings are up, and, and things like that. So our level of anger uh, is, is probably out of step with our evolutionary past. Evolution happens very slowly, but cultural changes happen fast. So you know, there's the joke that we still have the caveman brain or something like that. There's some truth to that, for sure. Um, uh, so yeah, I think evolution or emotions will continue to evolve and hopefully in a more positive direction. Um, uh, even anxiety, in, you know, in the past, what did you have fear over? You had fear over lightning or you had fear over a rattlesnake or a bear or something like that. Now, many of us deal with fear as long as we're awake. We're anxious all day long and that tears us apart. So. Our, there's a mismatch between our environment and our emotions. So yeah, there's probably going to be change over time if we live that long. But it takes a lot of generations. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. That's, yeah, emotions are my area of study. And, I, and what got me into it was an evolutionary perspective. Um, I grew up in a, a family that was very unemotional and, you know, let's get the job done and et cetera. And then when I read an evolutionary perspective, I was like, oh my gosh, these things have functions. There's a reason we have emotions. <laughs> and I was bowled over by that and just, you know, the evolutionary psych uh, perspective. That's, I mean, I changed from a computer science, uh, I was a software engineer for 16 years. And then I, I went back to school for psychology in large part because of that literature. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming. I'll be here uh, for a few minutes packing up.